Five every time. Okay. Um, we, I mean, the stories of hope, I think they were on its last week. Uh, this last week, it was number seven. But we've been running a little behind the actual ones that they were having at First Baptist was holding because we started in a little later after we had finished our study. So we're going to be looking at, I think we can look at a couple tonight because the stories are similar. Okay. And I think, I think we can work both of them in. Um, and I gave you, you know, in the emails, I gave you the attachments uh, that, that cover both of the actual stories. But I think one of the things that you find in terms, yeah, there you go. There you go, Victor. You know, one of the things that you find in terms of matters of hope are those situations that you run into in life that seem to have no solution right? And a lot of them are illnesses. Well, in this case, for tonight's, the ones we're going to be looking at, if we look at both of them, we're looking at leprosy, and we'll be looking at blindness. Now, both of those can be difficult situations, right? Because, hey, back then, you didn't have any kind of optometrist that could work on eyes, and they hadn't got to any point where they could do anything about leprosy. If you caught leprosy, Go back and read Leviticus, you know, about how leprosy was identified and what, even in God's economy, what needed to be done. See, people that had leprosy couldn't come in and be part of the community, could they? They were outcasts. And, and I mean, that was even part of the biblical mandate as well. You know, it was like, hey, <laughs> they can't hang with us. Almost sounds like this coronavirus now too, right? Don't you dare come in around us, you know? But it, so the reality was, is that these people were excommunicated. They had to live on the outskirts. And the requirement was too, that if they walked around other people, they had to say, unclean, unclean. Uh -huh. Now, if you don't think that would be demoralizing, I don't know what is, because think about it. You think you'd have any hope if everywhere you went, especially if you were going to be around people, that you had to go around yelling out, unclean, unclean? Do you think people would want to be around you? No. Man, they'd be shunning you from every direction, wouldn't they? So we'll start off with that one because I think we need to kind of contemplate what that means and how it affects your culture and society when people do run into situations like that, think about it. Man, those poor people didn't have any hope whatsoever. Have any of you watched the movie Ben-Hur? Yeah. Years, years ago. Yeah. You remember how the guy's uh, sister had, uh, I think it was his sister and mother caught yes. that. And remember how they had to go live in these caves? And he... You're talking and, about the one with Charlton Heston or the newest it, one? Uh, no, the older one. Yeah, Charlton Talk Heston. Heston. And remember how he'd have to go visit them? He'd have to go outside the city to go visit his wife, and they had to stay at a distance from him? That was pretty realistic in the way that they portrayed that, okay, in that Ben-Hur movie, the old Ben-Hur movie, like you said, Mark. Because, I mean, that's, and that was a real situation and a real condition that existed. But I think what we'll see is the beauty of hope in Jesus Christ. Did Jesus reject any of these people? Did Jesus touch these people? See, they shouldn't have even been coming close to him, but yet Jesus touched these people. Man, to me, it's like, wow, that is awesome. Talk about letting down barriers, you know, breaking down barriers. I mean, man, alive. So that's our intro. And we'll start up right after the prayer. Any questions on the intro? And, you know, that type of difficulties that you can experience in situations, you know? So. Same type of things they had back then, we're having today. Go figure, right? Amazing. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to study your word, to come together in unity as you've called us to. Let us show love for one another in the way you want us to love each other, Lord God, I pray. And let us be there for each other in all situations. Because, I mean, if we can't love each other, where's the hope 
in knowing you and being part of your family, Lord. Help us to live in a way that reflects that love and that other people may see it and say, yeah, that's what I want. I want relationships like that with Jesus and with, you know, God's children, because they reflect the love and a caring for one another. So we look to you, Lord, Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds as we study this, these stories of hope that you engender, Lord Jesus. And we thank you and praise you in your precious name. Amen. 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 Okay, let's go ahead and share out this screen. And let's take a look at the first one. And the first one that we have is the one uh, in Luke 17, 11 through 19. Now, what we have to understand, we're getting close to the end of Jesus's ministry. Because when it says at the beginning there in verse 11, notice that it says on the way to Jerusalem. What that meant, remember, the majority of Jesus's ministry was up in Galilee, up in the Galilee area, up in that north galilee eastern and uh western sides of northern galilee that's where the majority of his ministry was and the reason for that is he wasn't accepted in the community down in jerusalem if you remember they were looking to you know they were looking for any excuse to try to arrest jesus well that's one of the reasons jesus went up north but what you have to understand, too, is that up in the Galilee area, that was mostly Gentile. Yes, there were Jews up there, but it was a Gentile area, especially on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And as Jesus carried out his ministry, people came from all different areas. Remember, we studied one of, one of our studies in Hope, dealt with the demoniac that was up in the garrisons, up in the tombs. Well, that, that's the area on the eastern side of Sea of Galilee, and all that is Gentile area over there. And remember, man, that was a, ma a marvelous study of hope because, I mean, that poor guy was rejected. He was kicked out of cultures and societies. Nobody wanted him. He, he was demon-possessed, for heaven's sakes, and Jesus was able to free him. Well, we're still looking at mostly Gentiles, and if not Gentiles, even somebody, you know, even a group of people that the Jews probably hated at least as bad are the Samaritans, right? So look at what it says. On the way to Jerusalem, so Jesus is coming back from the North Sea of Galilee up there. He's coming down to Jerusalem. He was passing between Samaria and Galilee, okay? So he's on the Western side of the Sea of Galilee as he's coming down because now, remember, the Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritan hated the Jews, right? So Jesus coming down, he doesn't care, and he's coming down that way. I think that's beautiful. You know, he's, he's like, hey, wherever the Father leads, that's where I'm going, and I'm there for anybody. So he's there not only for the Jews, but look at that. He's there for the Samaritans, and he's there also for the, Gal you know, for the Gentiles, the Galilee side, as well as the Jews. So as we look at this, notice what it says in verse 12. And as he entered a village, they don't specify. He was met by 10 lepers. Notice that. Remember what I was saying? Who stood at a distance, right? See, they weren't allowed to come close to people. If they did, guess what? People would stone them. That's not good, right? It's not like they would just say, hey, 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 stay away. They would actually stone the people if they started coming close to them. So they had to stay at a distance. And they were used to raising their voices. See how it says, and they lifted up their voices because they had to lift up their voices, say, unclean. In other words, hey, you know, you don't want to come close to me because I'm sick. But they look at what they did. Instead of lifting up their voices and saying unclean, look what they said. They had heard about Jesus, right? So they say, Jesus, master, notice, once you put that title of master along with Jesus, you're asserting that he is Lord. And actually, if you go back and look at some of the, uh, the different, um, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Some of the commentaries. If you look at some of the commentaries, they say that when you say master in the way they were saying it, they were agreeing that he was was Sorry. the messiah so as as they're going basically they're saying something serious they know jesus is 
has power, okay? More than just a prophet. But look what they say, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Hey, isn't that the same thing that the publican prayed in the temple? Remember when Jesus saw the Pharisee in there and the Pharisee was praying all this, these big words and about, I'm glad I'm not like this, that publican over there, you know, that I tithe and I do all this. But yet the publican, that's exactly what he prayed, though, is he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, right? Well, that's the same thing these guys are asking of Jesus. They're asking for mercy. And as we said earlier, think about it. All their lives, they've been rejected. They've been outcast. They've been, the only people they could hang with were other lepers, okay? And that was it. So in this case, there's 10 of them that have come together, and they are, they are there to at least try to get Jesus' attention. I think they thought that if they had ever had a chance, this was it. So they weren't going to do it quietly. You know what I mean? I'm sure they were yelling, yo, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. But look at the beauty of it. When Jesus, he saw them, he said to them, notice what he says. He doesn't say, hey, be healed. Look what he says. Go and show yourself to the priest. Now, the way it speaks of this issue in the Old Testament is that if the only ones that had the authority to tell a person that they were clean was the priests, okay? They had specific instructions of what things to look for to see if a person indeed did have leprosy, if they were carrying the disease. But only the priests had that authority, okay? That's why Jesus is telling them, go show yourself to the priest. So now notice he doesn't say, hey, come over here. Let me put my hand on you. Let me put some oil on your forehead and do the cross on you. And, you know, all he does is he's going to check their faith, isn't he? He's basically saying, hey, for all intents and purposes, what he's saying is that the priest will say that you're already clean. If you believe what I'm telling you, then go and do it, right? So. Now notice, they didn't stop. They didn't ask, well, uh, well, uh, don't you have to do something more special? Do a rain dance around me or something, you know, or pull out a magic wand? No, look what they did. And as they went, they were cleansed. See, that's faith, right? Faith in action, because they didn't stop. They said, hey, if Jesus says that, that's all I need to hear, I'm on my way. And so that's what they did. They went based on their faith. And that's good. But one of the things that I think is most important is gratitude. And so let's see how gratitude plays out here, right? I mean, here they were healed on the way, so they know they're healed, but they don't have a clean bill of health yet because they have to go to the priest. The priest is the one that has to give them the check mark that says, yep, they're clean. They can live amongst people again. They don't have to go live outcast, right? But so they're on their way. They were cleansed, right? They were cleansed. But look at this. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And look how it finishes off that thought. Now he was a Samaritan. When you look at this, I mean, it paints a beautiful picture. Now, out of these 10, were they Jews? Were they Samaritans? Were they Gentiles? See, when you're a, when you're a person with that disease, it's no longer about whether you're a Samaritan, a Gentile, or a Jew. You're an outcast, okay? Nobody wants anything to do with you, so all of a sudden, ethnicity means nothing, you know, or it, it's, it's a crazy thing, but all of a sudden, those guys were one in unity because they all had the disease. They were all outcasts. But I think Jesus brings to the point here that the one that came back was a Samaritan because that is who the Jews hated. The Jews hated Samaritans, right? Because they were considered half-breeds. 
they weren't considered, you know, the, uh, God's really chosen people. That's, that's how they got identified by the Jews. But look, he comes back. And look what he does. Now, if there is any humbling or any praising, look how he turns. He saw that he was healed. He turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Man, talk about gratitude. I mean, he experienced hope. All of a sudden, he's like, let me ask you a question. Was Jesus actually a priest also? Yes. He was, he was a, he was three things. What were the three things that Jesus was? He is a king. Prophet, a, priest, and king. There you go. That's it. Prophet, priest, and king. So technically, think about it. He comes back to Jesus, the priest. So can Jesus technically absolve, you know, the disease? Yeah. But he's a Samaritan, right? But let's see what he says. Then Jesus answered, were not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? So chances are the others may have been Jews, okay? Because Jesus specifically says this foreigner. And he said, now look what he does. He said to him, rise and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, see, he doesn't say, wait, did you go stop with the priests? You know, he basically tells him, hey, you're good to go. He gives him the free bill of health. Now, and he's a Samaritan. So really, the, the Samaritan need a Jewish, you know, uh, absolution so that he could go back? Hey, it didn't matter to this guy. This guy came to Jesus, and he saw that Jesus was his hope. Jesus was the one who fundamentally healed him, brought him back to life from his outcast death, so to speak. And so when we see that, all of a sudden, what does that bring out about Jesus? It brings out that, man, in Jesus, we have hope. Jesus gives us hope beyond what this world can offer. Because nobody was able to offer those 10 anything, were they? Not until they came to Jesus did they have hope. But I think the beauty of it is they didn't come with a like this attitude of, hey, you need to heal me because I'm sick. But all of them called for mercy, right? They didn't say, hey, look, man, come on, you know, just be cool to me. You know, get this thing off of me. We don't want this anymore. No, they didn't come in dictating to Jesus anything. They came in asking for mercy. And they came in identifying Jesus as master. I think that that in and of itself put Jesus in a position where he said, hey, these guys have the faith. And that's why Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. Go on, you know, and if you have faith to get back to the priest, you're good to go. And they did, and they were all healed. Now, Jesus asks about the nine. Some would say, well, why would Jesus ask about the others? But the issue is this. Part of receiving the wonder and glory of God and hope that he provides shows that he's looking for what the Samaritan did. He's looking for that gratitude. Isn't that what he looked for in us? Doesn't he look for gratitude from us? Doesn't he look for us to be thankful to him, to glorify the Father through our thanksgiving to him? Yes, he makes it clear that that's where we are supposed to be, not in this specific passage, but he has made it clear that we are to give thanks in all things, right? In all things give thanks. That's where we're supposed to be in following the Lord. And the only one that did it here in this specific accounting was the Samaritan. And Jesus was impressed by this person's, you know, just, I mean, Obviously, he cared about Jesus more than the others. The others cared more about their healing, still trusting Jesus. I'm not di diminishing what they did because they were healed too. Jesus even said, we're not 10 cleansed, right? So Jesus knew they were going to be healed. But the issue is only the one came back. Only the one was thankful for the hope that Jesus had provided. Them. And I think that makes a big statement to us too. We need to be thankful in all things. Because, hey, 
It's Jesus who provides. It's Jesus who gives. It's Jesus who loves. He's the one full of grace and mercy, right? Amen. So that's the story on the ten, on the ten uh, lepers. Any questions, comments, additions, uh, you know, agreement or anything you want to add or take out of this thing? It's a beautiful picture, though, isn't it? Yeah, what I, I thought about, what I never noticed before, Ted, Jesus still respected the priest, the priest would, because it was the law. That's he right. didn't go against them. He still sent them back to the priest. Just like the law said, right? The law. Exactly. He, he, so he could have override that, but nope. Yep. Law is the law. Amen. And You're I right. just noticed that he still sent them back to get you know, yep. approved by the priest. Yep. And nine went to go get that done. And I guarantee you that they were healed. And the priest would have given them a check mark, so to speak. I think they went to have a party. They went to get some drinks. Oh, yeah. You better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> they went to celebrate because that would be on my mind. Boy, oh, I man. haven't seen Can my you mama. I haven't seen my girlfriend in 10 yeah. years. You, you, you got know. that right, brother. You the got flesh. That right. Say, I got to get me a drink. Go kiss my woman. <laughs> you want to think about drinking there, Mark? <laughs> Wait, say it again. What do you say? You got to think about drinking? <laughs> oh, celebrate. Get a glass of champagne. No, yeah. no, no. Because they didn't have marijuana back then, so they wouldn't want to go smoke. Yeah, they would have been like those in Miami, right? No, oh, they want to go. What they're going to do is get a drink and a nice kill a goat, kill a sheep, and celebrate. Yeah, amen. Amen. Was I'll leprosy? Tell you. Yeah, go ahead, Gail. I mean, yeah, Gail. Um, I was going to say uh, when the one gentleman uh, turned around and went back to thank Jesus. I've always felt like if we ask a prayer, even if it's for Lord, help me get to the store safely and back Amen. home. Amen. Or if it's for, I'm mean, going in for surgery, Lord, please help me through this safely. Guide the surgeon's hand. Amen. I always felt like if you don't thank God for the little things, he may not answer the big things that you ask him for. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, it's kind of like breaking fellowship, right? It's all because if you're not thankful, then it's about me, right? What yeah. can you do for me today, Lord? And just do it because, well, hey, you owe me. It's kind right. of that type of attitude. But when you thank him, you're saying it's not about me. It's about you. Yes. And you're the one that's done it. And I thank you for that. Yeah, good point, Gail. Good point. I was just wondering if leprosy, once you get it, do you, you, it's permanent. It's not something your body can fight off. That's right. Even today, they call it Hansen's disease. Yeah. And it's, it's not something that is reversible. Wow. I mean, now the issue is this, you can still, you know how the stories you hear about people with, you know, uh, fingers missing and stuff like that. Well, the reason those people had fingers missing, they don't just fall off. They don't rot off in the sense of how some people have made the story. What happened is that since they were outcasts and they couldn't work, they lived in places like in Ben-Hur, in caves or stuff like that. What happens is that your extremities do die, okay? Your nerves die. And the problem is, is that those are dead appendages. You can't feel them on your extremities. And the reason that they would lose them is because like rats or mice would come and oh. gnaw them off oh, and they my. didn't feel it because there's no nerves. And wow. so people just automatically assume that they would fall off. No, they don't fall off. Technically, if you were very careful, you could still keep your appendages. You wouldn't feel them. And, and the, the disease can spread in, in the body. But the issue is the way you lost the appendages was usually by some rodent or something that would come. Or you could, if you banged your hand against something really hard, you know how, you know, and if it broke a finger or something, it could fall off. I mean, it, it's a uh, terrible disease, a terrible disease. It's obviously contagious. Uh, well, that's why they kept people separated from them. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it is. I'd have to look that back up in Hansen's, you know, Hansen's disease. I don't know if it's exactly the same thing as the leprosy they had back then. It's very similar in description, but I don't know because I don't think Hansen's disease is actually uh, transmittable. 
I think yeah, it's, it, a, um, it's the same thing, Ted. Oh, okay. Everything you just said with nerve damage. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not a pretty disease. Let's put it that way. It's not yeah. a pretty disease. And it, it really damages, you know, your your appendages and it can, you know, get to your whole body. Okay. I mean it's it's a bad disease. It's a bad disease. There was a missionary that went over to minister to um leper colony and um they wouldn't accept him for some reason or another because they thought he was um i don't remember what the whole story was but they wouldn't accept him because he wasn't one of them i guess and they didn't trust him and then uh he kept hanging out with them and everything and then he woke up one morning and started seeing that white whatever it is yeah. on them yeah. and he was actually kind of grateful that he caught the disease because once he did that then he was one he, of them yep. they accepted him so it is still contagious. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you yeah. know there are leper colonies, and I don't know anything about that Hansen's disease, but yeah, I think that that um, it is still around and still contagious. My question is, what about that disease actually takes you out? I mean, does it? Um, do well, now it doesn't take you out. They do have a cure for it, Ted. It's curable. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's curable, but again, poor people probably can't afford it. Oh, that's that. in those poor countries. They not going to give it to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know, Donna. Yeah, but thank you all for that input. I mean, just to be accurate, you know. But uh, yeah, I do remember that story, Donna. I don't remember the name of the missionary, but yeah, I remember that story. But I, I was just wondering if, like, if it, if you lose feeling in your um, extremities, that that if it works its way in, then eventually your heart and your internal organs, you lose any, well, if the yeah. nerve endings don't work, then your heart would stop beating or your lungs would stop working or something like that. That's probably, it just probably just eats it away from the outside in and then you eventually just, you know, collapse because your organs probably fail. That would be yeah. my guess. But. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not that familiar with it, but I just know it is not a good disease. Well, I don't know any disease that is, but uh, yeah, so let me just make that clear. <laughs> but that is, yeah, that one's a scary, that's a scary disease. So think about, think about these poor guys and how much they had been just rejected their whole lives, or at least from the time that they caught it to, you know, Jesus's, you know, uh, letting them get healed or providing a healing solution to them through faith. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's an amazing thing. But I'll tell you what, I think, I think back then, leprosy was probably the disease with the least amount of hope. I mean, it's like all of a sudden you catch it and you're excommunicated. You're gone. You're out of here. And that's it. You know, you have and, and somebody's got to look after you. Okay, so that means family had to come and leave food. If you've watched that Ben Hur movie, that one part, remember he'd come and leave food for his his mother and sister, and then they would come out of the after he started going away, they would come out of the cave and pick up the food to eat. You know, I mean, they talk about a sad thing. Oh, by the way, in that movie, didn't they get healed at the end through Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I thought I remember that they got healed at the end through Jesus. So, I mean, boy, I'll tell you though, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. So a lot of them probably died of starvation because they didn't have any. Ex yeah. <laughs> if they didn't have anyone to come and look out for them. Yeah. I mean, where, where were they going to get their food? How were they going to get anything? You know, I mean, they were outcasts. They couldn't go into places where people were. I don't know if they could go into gleanings, you know, how in the Old Testament it talked about, you know, don't reap to the edge of your fields, you know, so that God may bless you. Um, and then that was for the sojourner, the needy, the poor. I don't know if, you know, if a leprous person could go in and try to get some food from gleanings, as long as they stayed away from people. I don't, yeah, it's talk about sad. Talk about sad and a difficult thing. Whew. No hope, I'm it would seem like. Back then. Yeah. I'm really grateful that I live in this day and time and not back then. <laughs> it, I'll tell you. Amen. But yet, even today, we got things that somehow, sometimes can take our eyes off the Lord, too, though. You know, 
that can make us seem like we don't have hope, just like these poor leprous people did. So, okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you think that the Lord allows certain diseases to come to us now uh, to remind us of things like that? Um, I've, I've often wondered about that type of question. Um, God is sovereign. So that means nothing happens that he's not aware of. Right. But the issue is, like with Job, even though God did not cause Job's ailments, yeah. He allowed Satan to do it. So in the picture, you can't look back and say, God, you know, you're unfair, you're unjust, you're, you know, you're a meanie up there. You know, no, he does it, but he does it for a greater plan and purpose. And for us who are Christians, we know that Romans 8.28 comes into play, right? That all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And we're part of him. Now, those things happen. God doesn't separate Christians and say, okay, hey, Christians aren't going to get it. Only those that don't believe are going to get it. What, it. The Bible's clear that it rains on the just and on the unjust alike. Um, now, as to God do the results of these things that happen, I think he lets Satan do things. And Satan, being the prince of the power of the air, has the ability to do these things when God lets him do it, just like he did with Job, okay? Uh -huh. But I still think it affects unbelievers in a certain way, but I think the way it affects believers is in, in exactly the way you're talking about. We, what does it do to us Christians when we're exposed to these things? And the issue is this, does it let you keep, does it build your relationship with the Lord, keep your eyes on him, or, do, or does it cause you to start doubting your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Right. So I think the Lord does it to build our faith, to right. build us up, to trust him more and stop looking at the situations, but to cast our cares on him and let him handle it. And right. we look to him for it. I think that that's the reason that God allows the evil one and the, as the prince of the power of the air to allow these things to happen in our, in our world today. And, and for us Christians, it helps us keep our eyes on him, trust him more, right? Right. Yeah. And it that, was what Job said, even though he slay me, I will still serve him. Amen. Amen. And I think that that's the right attitude. And it's our, that's the attitude we need to have too. It's not about this body. You know, a lot of times we tend to put too much weight on this body like, hey, we're going to have it for eternity. No, we're, we're here just for a short period of time, right? When you think about it, compared to eternity, we're just here for a short period of time. And if the Lord wants to take us earlier than yeah. later, well, praise the Lord. I mean, yeah, if, with the body is to be present with him. Amen. And, and if we're right with him, then we're ready. And whenever he decides to take us and in whatever way he takes us, I know we don't want to go through pain. We don't want to go through sorrow. But the reality is the Bible makes it clear that even we that follow Christ will have to endure those things. Yeah. The question is, how do we endure them? Do we endure them by getting mad at God and saying, God, if you were really a God of love, where were you? You know, or where are you when I'm going through? No, we do. We accept them. In grace, because we know that God is still in control, he's still on the throne, and we look to him for his strength to overcome any of these doubts that Satan may try to put in our heads about God not being capable of taking care of us. He is. He's quite capable, and he loves us with an everlasting love. Yeah. So he, that's what he wants. He just wants us to keep our eyes on him. Job lost family members too, right? Who? who? Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, Job lost all his children. The only wow. one that he didn't lose was his wife. And she's the one that told him, hey, why don't you curse. just curse God and die already? <laughs> oh, my word. And, and Job told her, hey, are you like one of those other women? You know, I mean, <laughs> talk about putting her in her place. Are you like one of those other women? And he says, should I receive only good from God but not evil? You know, basically what he's saying, hey, everything's going to happen for a plan and a purpose. And I trust God that no matter what, he's got a plan and a purpose. And I'm going to keep my eyes on him no matter what. 
But I think the other part of it is she had to bear him twice as many children after that, oh, after oh. all her other children had. <laughs> <laughs> I, never thought of, I never thought of it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> I just had that just tickled me it's like God has a sense of humor yes, I don't care does. what anybody says he's got a sense of humor like oh, and, man. and God blessed Job look at all that you know he had even a bigger family he, and more even after all that because he trusted God and that's what God wants of us he just wants us to trust him he blessed him after uh, after that whole thing with those three guys that sat with him out on the... Yep. <laughs> yeah, those <laughs> friends, after encouraging he, friends. Yeah. Right, but after all of that, he turned around and forgave and blessed Amen. his friends. It says he yes, blessed he his friends, and after he blessed his friends, then he got double back the blessing, which I thought Amazing. was kind of powerful that we have to have like, forgiveness, you know, whatever in our heart. Exactly. So that's what we're called to, isn't it? I mean, we're called to that kind of life and that kind of living too. Amen. Job's a good example. Yeah. Amen. Okay, let's see here. It's 454. You want to try to do the other one? Uh, Blind Bartimaeus? Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you what. I like that story because Blind Bartimaeus uh, slammed the Pharisees. I. I mean, I, they don't provide all that story in tonight, but I mean, I really like the way Blind Bartimaeus, uh, you know, addressed the Pharisees. But in this story, we're talking about blindness. Now, the guy's been blind from birth. So in a sense, he's, he doesn't know anything else. He only knows blindness, but of course, he knows that people can see, okay? <laughs> and so now Jesus is still coming, you know, uh, on his way, I don't know if he was on his way north or on his way south, but we're talking about Jericho. Jericho's down by the Jordan River, just north of the Dead Sea. Okay, that's where Jericho is. Can you and, make it bigger, Ted? Hit the plus. Oh, minus. oh, okay. But the thing is, this thing was left justified. Let me see if I can do something here, because I was trying that earlier. Hang on, let's see. Uh, hang on. That's littler. Come on, Ted. <laughs> uh, okay, see. Oh. Now, I'm trying to see how to get it over. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. I'll make it a little smaller. I don't want you guys to end up getting a headache here. <laughs> I could sit in the back of the room here. <laughs> ah, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. Better, right? Okay. And it says, and they came to Jericho. Now, he's talking about them. That means that he's with his disciples here. Okay, so they've come together to Jericho. And remember, that's the story of Rahab, right? Wasn't that the town that, you know, uh, Joshua went in and the, all the walls got broken down when they marched around uh, the city the seventh day, seven times, right? That's yep. Jericho, the yep. same city. And he says, and they came to Jericho. And so obviously he was there for the night, but as they were leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great and a great crowd because a hey, everywhere Jesus went, he always had a great crowd. Okay, look at who he has here. We're talking about Bartimaeus here now. Okay, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. So he's been in this town all his life. He's blind, and that's the only thing he can do that to be able to get some money. Okay, so he's a beggar, and he's the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And then when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, so obviously, hey, the, the news about Jesus is, is fairly widespread, okay? Because obviously he had heard it. Now, obviously, if he begged along the road, probably the people that went by had news that they might share with him, okay? And in this case, obviously, he had heard about Jesus. And he says, and when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Look at the similarity between him and those 10 lepers. He began to cry out because, hey, there's a big crowd around Jesus. You know that there's a hubbub whenever there's a big crowd, right? So he's making sure that people are hearing 
he needs to get the message to Jesus. So he began to cry out, Jesus. Now, I like this. Not only, he doesn't say master, but he says son of David. That means he knows, I think he understands that Jesus is the Messiah. The Old Testament pro prophesied that Jesus would come from King David, son of David, right? Notice that. I think he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He says, Jesus, son of David. Look what he says. The same thing that the 10 did, didn't he? Have mercy on me. He's also seeking mercy. It's not something we deserve, but the only one that can give it in this case is Jesus, right? And so he's yelling. But look, <laughs> isn't this how it is? People don't typically just say, hey, man, shh, shh, come on, man. Just, hey, we're trying to hear what Jesus is saying. Why don't you just shut up and let us hear what Jesus is saying? So many are rebuking him, telling him to be silent. But look what he does. <laughs> it's like, hey, I don't care what you guys say. Hey, I'm going to make sure Jesus is going to hear me. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And I, I mean, I think this is beautiful. You know, and Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, these are the ones that were telling him to be quiet. Take, <laughs> <laughs> take heart. Get up. He is calling you. All of a sudden now, they've come and come into the picture saying, hey, man, you just won the jackpot, dude. You know, Jesus is calling you saying, come on, come to him. Get up. <laughs> and look what he does. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Throwing off his cloak. Now, people don't normally throw off their clothes because remember, that was kind of like their blanket too. It wasn't just you know, their outer garment to keep them warm, but it was like their blanket. It was, uh, it was a multi-purpose thing, but he's like, I'm not going to let anything hold me back right now. This cloak is heavy. I want to get to him as fast as possible. So he's like, yeah, baby. And he's getting up and he's headed towards Jesus. Right. And so, uh, and Jesus stopped to say, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you thrown off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And look what Jesus says in this case. Different, his, Jesus' interaction with him is different than it was with the leprous people. He says, and Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? I think this is a beautiful picture because Jesus knew, you know, and I think Bartimaeus even knew. I think the whole crowd already knew, but he wanted to hear it from Bartimaeus. He wanted to know what was important to him. Why would he come seeking the Messiah, you know, for something? What's this something he wanted? And look, the blind man holds back nothing and says, well, you know, he doesn't hum and hem and haw. He says, and the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Just as simple as that, right? He's not begging anything. He just says, that's all I want. I just want to recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, I mean, that tells me that he knew who Jesus was. He knew his power. He knew his ability. And all he wanted was Jesus to show him mercy by giving him his sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, in this case, his face was based on what he asked for, right? Remember, with the 10 lepers, it wasn't anything they asked for, right? He just said, go and show yourself to the priests, right? He already knew they were lepers. They were already there. He just said, go and show yourself to the priests. And, and on the way, they were healed, right? Well, in this case, he asks him right here, what do you want me to do for you? blind man just said rabbi in other words that's a teacher uh title let me recover my son and jesus said go to your go on your way your faith has made you well and look what it says and immediately he recovered his sight and he didn't go anywhere look where he goes i'm gonna follow jesus i think that that's that's beautiful it's like and he followed him on the way and he had a great story i mean if you go read about him I mean, he, I mean, the, the Pharisees actually call him in. 
and say, how did you recover your sight? And he says, well, the man Jesus, he's the one that recovered my sight. Now, I mean, when you look at that, the, <laughs> and, and the Pharisees kept harping him about it, okay? But finally, he says, oh, do you guys also want to become disciples of Jesus? And basically, they cursed at him. <laughs> what do you mean? You don't want anything to do with that, <laughs> that loser. You know, that's their kind of their philosophy. And they spoke, spoke meanly to him, but even to the point where they kicked him out of the synagogue. Ted, is that the one when he, his mother and father came and he said, ask him yourself? I love that. That's it. Then, he, you know, and so the, they called in the, his parents. They said, hey, what about this son of yours? And I liked what the parents told him. Hey, he's old enough. He can speak for himself. You know, yes, I can tell you he's been blind from birth. But <laughs> they but had a he, thing about him being blind from birth. That's yeah, why they called that was the issue. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Because that, see, they had this issue that nobody could heal a blind person but God. If they were born blind. That's right. If they were born blind. And see, that was why they were trying to get the, the man or the parents to say, no, it was something else that happened. It was a fluke uh, that happened in his life or something like that to try to get around that topic that they believe, they are the ones that believed it as the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, that only God could, could, could heal a blind man, bring back a blind man's sight as if they were born blind. And so, you see, that totally broke down their way of believing. It really put in the position a thing that they had to acknowledge that Jesus was from God. And see, they didn't want to do that. Because the next step is believing that Jesus was God. See the issue? See the problem that they ran into? And so when the parents came in and said, no, no, uh, we're not going to speak for him. He's old enough. He can speak for himself. Guess what? They cast them out of the synagogue too. Like, hey, if you're associated <laughs> with this kid who's saying that he got healed by Jesus, then you're not, you know, you're not, you, you know, busting up that myth then you're out of here too. And you got to remember that if you were booted out of the synagogue, you basically had no support within the Jewish community. That's, I mean, that's how widespread the, the actual issue was with those people that were, you know, that ran the sin, or I mean, that ran the temple, the priests, the, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and, and the scribes, you know, the whole Sanhedrin, that if you got booted out by them, you had no support within the Jewish community anymore. Ted, I got to go to church. You got it, brother. Bye. God bless Bye, guys. You, man. Have a blessed night, guys. You too, Mark. God bless you, brother. Yep. So, I mean, when you look at that story, I think it's beautiful because, I mean, all he wanted, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a minimal sense, all he wanted was to receive his sight. But he knew that there was no other way, there was no other hope, than through Jesus of Nazareth. And hey, when he heard, it was like when he heard that Jesus was there, that he was coming down the road, man, I think that that guy's probably, his heart skipped a beat and he's like, yeah, you know, and he's like, I am not letting this pass by without talking to Jesus. And it worked out. He was able to talk to Jesus. Jesus healed him. I mean, it's a beautiful story. Because look what he did, and he followed him on the way. You know, he didn't take it for granted. It was just like that one Samaritan that came back from the tent. He worshiped the Lord. He followed Jesus. You know, the other nine were healed, but they didn't come back to follow Jesus. But this, the one Samaritan did, and we see also that Bartimaeus did. I think that's beautiful. You know, talk about hope. Talk about something that gives you a reason to live from then on. Those people really, in a sense, didn't have a reason to live. I mean, Bartimaeus was only going to be a beggar for the rest of his life, right? And, and you can see how the people treated him. They said, shut up, and they would rebuke him. You know, it's kind of like, hey, you have no standing. You have no importance. So just shut up. Let us who are healthy and everything, let us enjoy Jesus. Not you. You're blind, man. You know, just stay there and collect your money as you go. And so you can see how that type of person was treated in that culture. But once he was healed, guess what? 
he was treated as a human being, just like the, those, those lepers that also got healed. All of a sudden, they are no longer outcasts. They're back as part of the community. But I think the bigger beauty of it all is that they have a message about who healed them. Even the nine had a message about who healed them, the ones that didn't come back and say thank you to Jesus. They all had a message of hope that Jesus did that for them and that Jesus had that power. And who knows, uh, following Jesus, they would have learned Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. Who knows what, you know, we don't get a bigger picture as to what happened with the 10 lepers after that or what happened with Bartimaeus. But hey, I think that just like the, the demoniac from that was up in uh, the garrisons and, and the tombs, remember when he got healed, what did he do? He wanted to follow Jesus, but didn't Jesus say, go back to your city, your town, and go share the news that Jesus healed you. And he was a Gentile. So think about how much he was able to provide that testimony about Jesus and how many people that he would have told about Jesus probably went to go find Jesus after that and follow him. Remember, that's why he has these big crowds. That's why he is saying here, you know, when he went to Jericho, uh, look, he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd was with him, you know? So, hey, they've heard about Jesus and they were following him. N maybe not all for the right reason, you know, because in this case, think about those people that Jesus fed, right? Remember when he fed the 4,000 and he, I mean, the 5,000, then he fed the 4,000 and I mean, some, Jesus even told them at one time that, hey, the reason you're following me is because, you know, I fed those that were over there, and you're thinking you're just going to get a free meal out of this. But, I mean, he, I, he didn't say that in a nasty way. He is just saying it in, an, in a way that, hey, you're following me for the wrong reason. You know, you need to be following me for the right reason. Because Jesus always had the right message. He's the one that had the message of life and the message of, of God. And so that's what he was, you know, addressing the people with was the good news. He, Jesus was putting out the good news of what he had come for. So I forgot already. Did he tell the lepers your faith has made you well? No, nope, no, nope, because he, they left, you know, but he oh, did. Oh, that's right. They, that's but, right. but the one that came back, hang on, hang on. But the one that came back, I think he might have said something. Hang on. Let me see something here on that one. Um, on Jerusalem, be uh, and Jesus answered, "Were not ten cleansed? Was not one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner?" He said, "Rise." Yeah, see, he did say it to the one guy that came back at the very end. He says, "Rise and go on your way. Your faith has made you well." Only to the one, even though the others were healed along the way, so they had faith. But in this case, Jesus was more pleased with the with the leper. I mean, with the one Samaritan leper out of them all so yes yes well if you don't get healed though that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have faith that's right um well didn't jesus say that if you even have faith as a grain of a mustard seed you can move mountains um i mean the thing is it's in the trust of the lord jesus christ it's in the trust of god that these things come about it's by trusting him that's the faith we have is when you, we read his word and we say, I accept it, and I accept God, that's faith. That's trusting him, even though in some ways your, your human rationality may be saying, yeah, but that doesn't make total sense, or I'm not really sure about that. You, you throw that aside, and that's what the Romans 12, 2 thing is about. We're no longer, you know, uh, being not, we're no longer conformed to this world, the way of our worldly thinking, but instead we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. So when we have that struggle between what the world wants us to do and what God tells us to do or expects us to do based on his word, we need to go with what the spirit gives us direction to do. And in doing that, then, then we overcome these weaknesses of the flesh, these problems that can hang us up in that type of a situation because we trust him that's what he wants he just wants us to trust him to love him to trust him 
And Jesus said, hey, and if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. He didn't say if they make sense to you. He just said you will. Because that's, we, our trust is in him. Our love is in him. We care about him. And he loves us with an everlasting love. So, yeah. So any questions about either story or how, you know, the beauty of both of them together in terms of the hope that these people that had no hope, all of a sudden they had hope, you know, and I think it's beautiful. Yeah, go ahead, Gail. Uh, was Jericho rebuilt? Uh, I know this is going back to the first section right. we were studying. Was Jericho rebuilt after it was? Yes. It was. Josh, yeah, Joshua put a curse on it, though. He said that if anyone was to rebuild Jericho, the walls of Jericho, that it would be at the cost of their first son and their youngest son. Oh. And that's what happened. A guy went and did it, and sure enough, his firstborn died. And then as he finished up, his youngest son died. But yes, but Jericho was rebuilt, even though that person suffered the curse that Jericho had pronounced would happen for anybody that tried to rebuild it, yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Ted. Yeah. Um, I just feel compelled to tell a story. Of, I'll, I'll make it simple, you know, so it's not that long. Okay. But I feel that I'm being told, to, you know, by the spirit to tell you about it. Uh, this is my testimony. Um, I, uh, nobody knows that I was going to say this. So, uh I was trying to, I remember back when, uh, before I had Bobby, I was trying to, uh, this is like my little testimony about thing uh, that uh, relates to what you're trying to explain. Uh, I was trying to get pregnant with Bobby. I was trying to have Bobby and uh, I tried, I tried, I tried for a year. I did everything I could. I took ovulation tests. I, I watched everything. I did everything I could. I tried and tried and tried. I wanted so bad to have Bobby. I wanted so bad to get pregnant. And um, so I I just, I had this little uh, magnet from my grandfather when, when he was alive. He had cancer. He says, if you had the face as much as this mustard seed, you can uh, uh, do anything or move, move, mountains. move mountains. Yeah, that's what Jesus move said. Move mountains, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I kept believing in the Lord that he was going to give me a child. And I just kept believing. And I, you know, I, uh, at the time I smoked cigarettes. I know it wasn't the right thing to do and it wasn't the smart thing to do and everything. Mm -hmm. But at the time I did. And uh, Gail knows this story. And uh, so uh, I, I kept saying, well, you know, Lord, you know, if, 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 if I get pregnant, I'll, I'll quit smoking. I promise. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no uh, doubt in my mind. I, I'll do it. I'll, I'll quit smoking. And this went on for like a year and a year and a half, and this wasn't working for me. Uh -huh. And uh, so finally, uh, I, I, I just couldn't get pregnant. And so finally, I just said, I, I felt that God said, "No, you quit smoking, and then you'll get pregnant." Hmm. Amen. So I felt that I, I felt that somebody was telling me that I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't a, 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 a really a living a Christian life, but you know, I was trying, I was trying to have faith in God, and I didn't have much faith, you know, to begin with, but I was trying my faith, and so I quit smoking, and the next month I got pregnant. See you there, praise the Lord. I mean, it's amazing how God can work, you know, in us today. You know, and sometimes we don't even think about it being the Lord doing it. But I tell you what, when you go back, I think hindsight is a big thing. And a lot of times we don't give do God all the honor. Way, if you do things his way, <laughs> it'll work. But it's not going to work if you want to do things your way. If you want to run the scene and say, well, look, at God, I got this. You know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. My mom says that if you want to make the Lord laugh, tell him your plans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me just break in here a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no problem, Julie. I'm sorry that you're going through a lot of pain. Uh, we'll be praying for you. I got that. I see that, you know, your son's court's on Tuesday, and we'll continue to pray for that, and also for Irene, uh, her lawyer. Uh, and also, uh, and also, uh, 
Yeah, and your your yeah. your, and daughter your, your, your daughter who is being tested, right? Being tested, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. God yeah. bless, guys. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be praying yeah, we'll, for you. We'll praying yeah, praying good night, you. Julie yeah, and Yvonne. Julie, God bless you. Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So, did that finish up your, your testimony, Miss, uh, Misty? Yeah, I just, okay. I always thought that I could do things on my own and that, yep. you know, everything was <laughs> going to be done my way. And, you know, I was having faith, but I was having faith more in, in myself than yep. I was in Christ. And, and the moment I, I let go of all that and decided to do things his way, that's when everything fell in place, and here's Bobby, you know. Even Praise then. God. Praise God. <laughs> and what a blessing Bobby's been. Amen. Yes, he has. Amen. I believe that he's going to do good things in yep. his life. I do. Absolutely. Well, good. Well, Praise well, the Lord. Anybody else? Final questions, comments, additions, subtractions, disagreements? Agreements. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a good job, Jed. Oh, praise the Lord. Okay. Um, okay, I've got all of, uh, I see all of the requests for prayer that uh, Julie left. We'll be praying for Robert again, because like Gail had said, he is asking for prayer, continued prayer. We'll be praying for him and peace for his family and his peace too, you know, because I mean, it's rough losing a parent. It's not like as if you just say, okay, I'm done with that. Next, you know, it doesn't work that way. I mean, it's, Losing a family member is really, really tough. So we need to pray for him. Any other prayer items? Well, talking about permitting your garage, my oh. brother has a <laughs> permit dispute in Bushnell. Too. Oh, okay. He's going before the zoning board. Oh, my. And he wants me to come with my court reporting machine, you know, and write everything. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking forward to contentious watching him, you know, but I hear you. The, and that's Tuesday at okay. 530. Oh, awesome. That's your, is that your brother? Yeah. Okay. Okay. He, he owns and, and builds properties. Oh, in gotcha. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, we will do, Gene. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead there, Doug. Uh, we're going to say a prayer for Katie. She's got either a flu or something like that. Oh, man. And also we want to pray for the pastor on his surgery coming up. You got it, brother. Monday, yeah. Yeah. Is that still on Monday? Yeah. Yep. yep. That's, that's the latest I've heard, yeah, that it's still Monday. I'm guessing he won't be in the services tomorrow because maybe you want to stay away from yeah, it'll probably have to prep, too. I mean, there are certain things you prep for for surgery, so, yeah. Amen. Anybody else? Going into the hospital tomorrow and spending the night. Oh, um, that's possible. Yeah, because that, then they can observe and get him all ready. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, I was talking to my mom, and she said that that's what um, she's pretty sure that he's going in tomorrow, so he won't be at service tomorrow morning. Right, right. Anyway, I don't, I'm, I, that's just what I heard. I'm not, but we'll be praying. Yeah, and, need, and needless to say, we'll be praying, and I'm sure God will have his hand on him. Yeah. Does anybody know how they found out he had that tumor? Was he falling down or something? Well, when he fell down and off the bicycle, they did several MRIs on him. Oh, because, okay. And I think that's where it came out. Is okay. they saw it, you know, as part of the overall inspecting him because oh. of his fall and how busted up he got. Because I mean, he could have bonged his head, and you know. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So it, it came out of all of that, I know. But I guess maybe he was born with it. He didn't really have symptoms. I don't know. Yeah. Apparently, I, it sounds like yeah, like Gail's nodding her head there. I, mm -hmm. I think it, it, she's had it a long time, then never even knew it. Yeah, he said that he's had it for about, they estimate he's had it for about 36 years. Yeah, wow. see, well, I guess so. He wouldn't have been born with it, but 36, that's, you know, almost half his life. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, thought, uh, I thought it was something with his heart when he well, was born. Oh, that was the heart. Yeah, heart. He was born with a two valve instead of a three valve. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah, they fixed that already. So that's repaired. So praise the Lord for that. Yeah. I don't think it had nothing to do with his head. 
Yeah, right. So, well, hey, but maybe there was a blessing in his falling yeah. on the bicycle to get things fixed that he didn't realize, you know, that he had issues with that needed to be resolved. So, yeah, I'm sure he'd say, hey, Lord, couldn't have you have done it? Like, just reveal it to me instead. <laughs> just tell me I got... <laughs> Did I have to go through all of this? Do it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, then, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these great stories um, of how you work some wonderful opportunities for people that appeared to have no hope. But in you, Lord Jesus, man, they, they were able to come into a full and productive life after they met you and after they, you know, had an experience with you. And Lord, I know that you work the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that you're there for us in all things. Lord, let us have that same kind of faith that Bartimaeus had, that, you know, and like the Samaritan that came back and praised Jesus for what he had done for him. Help us to walk in that kind of faith, to trust you, through every situation in our lives. And not to look at it in a negative way, but look at it in a positive way because you are in control. And in everything, you are in control. And that you mean it for good to anything that happens to us. Just like, you know, we look at Job and many would say, yeah, but why did God allow Satan to do that? Well, he did it for his honor and glory. And Job knew it. And so he looked to him as, as his Lord and God, no matter what the situation, and God blessed him for that. Help us to have that same mindset, Lord, not to look at the circumstance or the problem, but to look to you and to trust you in and through it and know that you are our hope and stay. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for this great Bible study lesson, Holy Spirit, and thank you for showing us these wonderful things today. And let us live it and walk it in a way that honors and pleases you. Now, Lord, I want to pray for Robert Halliburton, our brother. You know, that's part of our life group. I pray that you would just be with him, Lord. You know, he lost his mom. You know that. And we pray that you just give him peace through this matter. I thank you that a pastor was able to get in touch with him and at least pray with him and, and talk with him. And it's helped him. But, Lord, we pray that you just reveal yourself to him in a mighty and powerful way. And give him the peace that surpasses understanding. That you would just give him rest in this matter. And Lord, because we look to you in all these things. And not only Robert, but the rest of this family, Lord, that you would give peace at the passing of their mother. And we trust you. And we praise you. And we honor and glorify you. Now, Lord, I also pray on this upcoming Tuesday court that Jean's going to to help her brother. Lord, you know the situation, and, you know, sometimes helping a sibling out can sometimes be a little rough and, and you know, problematic because, I mean, maybe something will show up from that person that you don't want to see, or maybe just, who knows? But, Lord, I just pray that you give peace to her brother and let his matter get resolved in a peaceful way, Lord, I pray. And uh, give peace to Jean as she goes and helps her brother to be able to do this, this court appearance there, Lord. I also want to pray for Katie, Lord. You know, she always deals with issues, you know. Uh, and, and in this case, you know, she seems to be dealing with some type of flu. I pray that you put your healing hand on her, Lord. And just resolve this matter so that she can come out of that. And that she's not stuck with that flu kind of thing that she's having. I also pray for the pastor, Pastor uh, David, as he goes in for surgery on Monday. Maybe he's going in, some, you know, tomorrow evening, but you know. And we ask, Lord, that, you know, we've been praying for this all along. It's no surprise to you, not that anything ever is. But we ask you to be with him, Lord, just like you have been with him through all these difficult times that he's been experiencing since about the beginning of the year. Look how well you've, you've healed him and had him recover. And now he's got this last item that needs to be resolved, that, that growth in his brain that needs to be taken care of. I pray you give wisdom, skill, and insight to the doctors. And that you guide their hands 
and that this this growth would be removed and that it be benign and that it just you know have no further impact and that there be no damage in the process because lord we look to you you're jehovah rapha god our healer so we look to you in that lord also want to pray for uh julie's son who's going to be going into court on tuesday as a custody issue for their child um, from his ex-wife and i know they're going to be dealing with that but you know his lawyer his attorney uh had that stroke and she's been dealing with some recovery from that mini stroke that she had but she apparently still wants to do the the hearing so lord please be with her I pray that she's recovered enough to be able to do this and do it in the right way. And Lord, we know that you're a just God. You want things to be done right and proper and in a way that brings honor and glory and honesty to the equation. Because that's what you are, Lord. And that's how I pray this works out. And that little Isabella would be, you know, given to the her, her father who hopefully we'll bring her up in your ways, Lord Jesus, because that's what we want. That's the outcome is that we want little Isabella to be brought up in following you, Lord. And so far, we don't see that her mother would be able to do that. But I still pray for her mother, Lord, uh, that you would be with her and that you would, you know, touch her heart, show her that you are real and bring her out of any kind of occult type of practices that she's in and show her that, man, with Satan, there is no future, Lord. Nothing of any value comes from that relationship. So break her free from that, Lord Jesus, I pray. And bring her into a way of seeing that the only way is through you, Lord Jesus. And also I pray for their daughter, who's in the army, that apparently was exposed to somebody with COVID. I pray, Lord, you know, she has to go back through some other testing. I pray that that come up negative. Lord, that you would just be with her because, I mean, that does impact her, her work in the army. So I, I also ask that you just keep her from any COVID and that your, your hand is on her, Lord Jesus, so that she can just continue on. And also, I pray for Julie and Ivan, who have been dealing with a lot of pain lately. Put your hand on them, Lord, and, you know, help take this pain away from them. And, and give them freedom from that, Lord, because they seem that, you know, with their cancer that they're dealing with, I know both of them have issues with that pain that comes with it. But nothing's impossible for you, Lord. So we look to you and we put them in your hand and ask you to just be there for them and, and resolve those pain issues. Thank you for what they're doing in their home already and that it's almost totally repaired. We thank you for that, Lord, and that you've brought that about to you. Now, Lord, as we go, I know there are many prayer requests that probably haven't even been mentioned. I know Donna's mom has been doing a lot better. Praise you, Lord, for that. And she's doing well with the medication. And I know that all of us have other issues in our families that we just haven't brought up. But there's nothing hidden from you, Lord. And we come boldly before your throne, just letting you know that we trust you. And we know that you can work all things out for good. Because we are your children. And we love you, Lord. And we seek you and we ask that you just give us your direction and guidance and let us walk by your spirit so that we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh and we will honor and glorify you in all things. Be with us as we go now, Lord, I pray. And I pray that for those that can make it into church service, that you would bless them and those that watch it online, you would bless them too as we, as we take in the services tomorrow, we pray. We thank you and we praise you. We give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, everybody. Amen. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank yeah, you. Bye, Thank Aaron. You. Give love to the family, Aaron. Bye, y'all. We'll do. Thank you. Bye. Hey, hey Bobby. Everybody. Hey, you got it, Aaron. Yep. Bye. Bye. Yep. Praise the Lord. Okay. Good night there, Donna. Good night, Margaret. Good night, everybody. Thanks Good. to the study. My pleasure. Praise the Lord. God is good. Good night, Dan. Good we'll night, Margaret. You, Wednesday. you got it, my sister. God bless you. Hey, and we're going to start in Genesis. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So I look forward to that. So God bless you. Good night. God bless you. Okay. Bye-bye.